Today on The Complete Rider, we take you to the far-off land of fire and ice. And, of course, horses. Iceland. And we'll show you a creative way to look at the insides of a horse. All that and your letters, here on The Complete Rider. Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of The Complete Rider. I'm Jan Coldwell and we have a terrific show for you today. I'm David Paulson and recently our camera crew had the opportunity to visit Iceland in search of the secrets and historic tales behind the Icelandic horse. What they found was a horse that is not only revered by its people, but one that is fast becoming one of the most popular breeds in the world. From this land of fire and ice comes one of the most unique breeds of horses in the world. As if scribed out of the land, this horse has remained relatively untouched for over a thousand years, and many believe it to be the purest breed of horse in the world. There is something quite special about this small breed. It has not only survived centuries of isolation and harsh Icelandic conditions, it has thrived to make its mark on a land and its people. Since the 9th century, when these horses' ancestors first arrived with the Viking settlers, it played an important role. But horses in Iceland are more than just working animals. They have become a big part of this country's identity. In Iceland, the horse literally follows man from birth to death and has come to be known as the most useful servant. <laughs> In Iceland, it's safe to say that horses are a national obsession. Songs, even folklore, are riddled with references to the horse. This fact that Icelanders are horse crazy may best be confirmed by the presence of more than 80,000 horses in Iceland, no small number for a country that only has 300,000 people. In every town, there is at least one stable and throughout the island there are horse trails everywhere, which has helped make horseback riding the national pastime. But what we found really interesting is that there's only one breed of horse on the entire island, and it has been that way for over a thousand years. This is partially due to the isolation of Iceland, but also because the government placed an importation ban on horses in the early 1900s. This has led to a horse that has very pure bloodlines and is like no other in the world. For instance, the Icelandic horse is one of the few horses that has a fifth gait. The Icelandics call it the tolt. It is a natural four-beat gait that makes for an extremely comfortable ride in which the horse moves its feet in the same manner as in the walk. Other breeds, such as the American Saddlebred, have a similar gait, sometimes called the running walk, but no horse can manage this gait as naturally as the Icelandic horse. Another interesting fact is that the Icelandic horse has no official color. This breed boasts at least 40 different colors and about 100 different variations. This is because these horses have been left to breed naturally amongst the herd for centuries. It's a feature I think is wonderful, and when you see these different colored horses running in a herd with their long manes and tails, it makes for a spectacular sight. One person who knows a lot about the Icelandic horse is Anders Hansen. He's the owner of the Arbaki Horse Farm, which is one of Iceland's largest breeding operations. We asked him to tell us about these horses' long history. The horse were, were brought to Iceland by the Vikings, who settled the island about 1,100 years ago. And uh, most of them came from Norway, probably, also from Sweden, Denmark, and Ireland, and other British Isles. And, uh, 
the horse the horses have been isolated here ever since it is a horse it's not a pony by international standards it's a little bigger than a pony so it's a horse but not a big horse but very uh, strong and uh, and uh, they are independent but uh, they are also easy to handle and uh, easy to cooperate with uh, with the people and uh, you can trust most of the horses for your children. You can walk around them. They won't kick you. They won't bite you. You can crawl under them, sit on their back, and uh, you would never expect anything mean from them. This is a five years old mare, a future brood mare, we think. And uh, she has many of the good things we are looking for in our horses. She is rather big for the first. She has uh, long and thick mane, which is important for this breed. We want her uh, head to be fine like this has, rather big eyes and, uh, and the nose line has to be correct. And she has uh, strong legs, lot of hair on her legs and the hooves are both big and strong. And there is a good harmony in this horse, she has long neck and, and her back is quite long as well and, uh, and high or long legs. So this is what we are looking for in our horse and it's just a good horse. But perhaps the most distinctive quality of these horses comes from the land. In Iceland, young horses stay with the herd and live outdoors for the first four years of their lives. During our visit, we were asked to join a roundup in northern Iceland. Each year, these local farmers gather their horses and drive them into the highlands for the summer and fall. This system of raising horses in a wild herd is an essential part of creating their unique personality. There are many different reasons for the way we bring up our horses. One of them is, is the tradition and heritage of doing it because in the old days we didn't have any fancy stables and houses like we do today. And so the horse would have to survive outdoors year-round. And in the north of Iceland, people still have the possibility of driving horses up into the highlands and the mountains and leaving them there for maybe three months or so and then rounding them back up. And what this gives us is a different type of horse. It, it molds the character of the horse and it, it gives you a stronger, more courageous, more independent horse, we believe. And so our horses have a very strong herd instinct and they communicate a lot with each other. And we feel that if we can combine this with other sort of handling of horses and training, we get the perfect horse. Magnus Larison is one of the top trainers in Iceland and has spent considerable time training horses around the world. His job usually begins once a horse reaches four years old. On this day, Magnus is introducing a horse to the round pen for the first time. He believes that by letting these horses be amongst the herd until they are four, they have a distinct advantage because they have learned how to survive on their own. We uh, don't have our horses in prison. We allow, allow them to be among the, the others. They, they socialize, they learn the rules. Who, 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 uh, is uh, responsible for what and what they are allowed to do and when. Perhaps we have or give them more chance to develop their instincts, like know their way around, get used to different uh, environments, get them uh, used to run, go fast, go slowly, and get them more, uh, uh, let's say, fit and sturdy for later purposes instead of those that are maybe kept in a small confinement. They uh, don't get the right stimuli at the right time, so they become a little bit different. That is what I believe is uh, more on the table that uh, we give our horses the right stimuli, the right environment at the right time, so they can de develop and become a horse. Don't go away, 
When we return, the Icelandic horse takes the world by storm. You may think that the shipping yards is an odd place for horses to be, but not in Iceland. The Icelandic horse isn't just popular in its home country, it's quickly becoming one of the most sought after breeds around the world. Approximately 3,000 horses are exported each year, and it's estimated that there are about 50,000 Icelandic horses living in other countries. For these horses, they're beginning a 10-day journey to Holland, and since there's a ban on any importation of horses, even Icelandic horses, these animals will never again set foot on home soil. Another area that has just exploded is the trail ride business. Riding tours across the highlands are so popular that some groups number up to 30 riders and around 100 horses. In many cases, foreigners are traveling to Iceland just for the opportunity to ride an Icelandic pony. Two people who know just how popular the Icelandic horses become are horse breeders Gunnar Arnason and his wife Kristbjörg. They export hundreds of horses from Iceland each year to customers around the world and it's a life they wouldn't trade for anything. It becomes some kind of a lifestyle. It's like children. You follow them when they're growing up, and every horse has his own character, and it's something you can't be without. It's just so, it's difficult to say why, but it is like that. Gunnar and Chris Bjorg care for about 80 horses on their farm at any given time. You can tell that they truly love their animals, which must make it difficult to sell them sometimes, knowing that the horse is leaving the island forever. Of course, especially if it's horses we have had ourselves for a longer time, then it's often very difficult. And uh, when you notice that the horse know you again after maybe two years. It takes in your heart. It can be very difficult. And some horses you don't dream of selling because you don't want to lose the sight of them. Anders Hansen has also seen how popular his horses have become around the globe. He believes some of their popularity is because these horses are so easy to take care of. It is very easy to keep Icelandic horses. They go out all year round. Uh, they can be outdoors in Iceland and in colder countries like Alaska, Canada, and some parts of Europe and the and, uh, United States. Not so many problems to keep the horse or feed them. They eat mostly just hay and, and grass. And uh, at this farm where we have over 200 horses, we don't need to have the vet here, not every week, not every month sometimes. And we can float their teeth, we will trim their hooves and deworm them, and we don't have any, any diseases or any problems of that sort. Whether they're on the highlands or in a field close to a farm, you can't copy the vastness of Iceland and the view they have all the time. You know, you can, you can breed Icelandic horses anywhere in the world, but you don't get the same thing as you get right here. You know, we, we've, we don't think that any other breed compares to this breed. <laughs> For over a thousand years, these horses have ruled this landscape and laid claim to the dreams of an entire nation. Let's hope that remains true for another thousand years, for it would be sad if these horses were to change in any way.
We call the demonstration the visible horse, uh, sort of anatomy in motion, because we have his bones painted on one side and the muscle groups painted over the bones on the other. And it shows how the muscles move the bones and it uh, lets you see how the anatomy works in action. And we're particularly interested in helping horse owners understand what is good movement for a horse. Good movement makes him stronger, easier to ride, sounder. In bad movement, if he uses himself poorly, then he, will, he can get a sore back, he moves badly, they never reach their potential, and it's ugly and damaging and hard to ride. But we've got all the major muscle groups, not all the superficial muscles, but the muscles back here at the hindquarters, at the front of his hindquarters, are the ones that pick up his hind leg and swing it forward under his body. We call that engagement, and that's what gives the horse his power. And then the ones in pink and red and orange painted around the back of his hindquarters are the ones that straighten his hind leg and push his whole body forward once that hind leg's on the ground. And they tie into the longest muscles of his back, the ones painted in pink and yellow, and the big long orange one that come down the side and they tie into the muscles on the top of his neck. So you could say he has a chain of muscle from his hind leg over his butt, through his back, and up along the top of the neck. And that chain of muscle should ripple and stretch every time he takes a stride. The, the muscles that run down the side of the neck and the underside of the neck, these, by the way, actually connect to his tongue. So you could say his tongue and the muscles at the back of his throat actually connect his mouth to his front legs and those travel on down. We have the abdominals that run from the breastbone all the way back to the pelvis, and the psoas muscles that run from the underside of his back to his hind legs, and all together those make up what we call the circle of muscles. And a horse should use that circle of muscles in harmony so that one set doesn't get overused and one set doesn't get uh, left out of the picture. And when he does that, he's moving well, whatever kind of horse he happens to be. Thanks again for all your letters. This week, we take a look at a question from Riley Davidson, who has a problem with feeding time. Feeding for horses, that is. And Riley's question for Jeanette is, I have a small herd of horses and recently introduced a new gelding. Now feeding time is very traumatic and at times dangerous. What should I do? Well, Riley, you have a problem. Um, probably you didn't tell me if you got rid of a horse. And what's going on is you have uh, a pecking order establishment that's going on. I can't tell you if it's your new gelding or if you got rid of a horse, if you have somebody who's come up through the ranks and is going to do some, uh, uh, is trying to establish themselves as the boss horse. Now, typically what you do, there's two things you can do with them. First off, make sure you're feeding quite a bit of roughage to these horses. That generally slows down, the, uh, they're full, they're not quite as anxious about their grain, so things will be a little slower at that time. The second thing you do is watch them, even though that's hard. Watch them while they're eating and figure out who's doing the biggest amount of picking on. Take that horse out of the group. Feed it separately and see what happens to the group dynamics. You will have to keep watching because sometimes you didn't quite pick the right one at the right time. Uh, usually in a small group of horses, if you're lucky, you get what I call a benevolent dictator. Somebody who's the boss, there's no question there that they're top of the line, but they also don't allow too much kerfuffle below them. When you, with your benevolent dictator, if you lose that one, it's gonna take a while to get them back together but separating them at the feeding time, find the bully, get them out, and things should quieten down. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>